How is it that uh, you, you've traveled the world, you've acted the world, you grew up in Canada, oh, such an elegant life you've led. How did you wind up being a neighbor of ours here in the land of zero zip codes in Connecticut? <laughs> How did that happen? My last phrase, would you say that slowly? <laughs> you can. I don't think I can. I think I dislocated my tongue saying it the first time. <laughs> what was that? How did you wind up in Connecticut? Oh. I don't know. I had a house in Weston when I was uh, in, the, in the 50s. I used to come out and spend weekends here. I was doing a lot of Broadway plays. And uh, I loved coming out of the country. So naturally, when I went away to live in England and Europe, and then came back in the 70s, I went straight back to Connecticut again. To me, it reminded me of England. It reminded me, I love the, the change of color that I grew up with in Canada, the, the autumns and the, the superb, and the fact that it was close to my favorite bars in New York. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to have never suffered from thirst in your life. <laughs> yeah. oh, hold, hold on, we have a question here. Let me get, let me get the microphone to you. <laughs> oh, I think you do. I, she doesn't need to learn something from each movie. What did you learn from making the sound of music? Because that was, I thought, one of your most delightful movies. Oh, uh, that's sweet of you to say that. But, uh, um, I learned to stay away from children. <laughs> Mr. Plummer, hi. Um, can you speak a little bit about the nuances of working on a live stage and filming a movie, and which do you prefer? Oh, well, <clears throat> I think there is not really a huge difference. Uh, if, you're, if you've been trained, you should be trained in the theater first, I think, if you want to go back to the stage because the other way around is a little bit disastrous. I mean, a lot of movie stars who have been marvelous in films have suddenly come to New York or London and got themselves on the stage and they, and they fall off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and because they have had, never had any training of how to sort of project to an audience or be aware that there's an audience there. And the work is, is in close-up in their minds. Everything is very quiet and, and intimate. And uh, you need to... In, in the theater, you need to do that same intimacy, but you must know how to project it to the back row. So those are the, those are, those are the only differences. Otherwise, you can go crazy in movies and crazy, and, and you can go as wild as you can in the theater. There's no, there are no rules to bar you from that. I'm going to pass the microphone down here. <coughs> uh, speaking of which, Mr. Palmer, uh, thank you for many, many wonderful uh, evenings in the theater. I've, I've been watching you, I think it's since Royal Hunt of the Sun back in the 60s at some point. Yeah. Um, will we have the privilege of seeing you on Broadway again soon? Yeah, I think so. I just did this uh, summer. I've just come back from um, my old Canadian haunt up there and I've written a one man show that I do uh, on, uh, on the, my love of literature. And ever since I was a child, and it goes follows me through my whole life. Uh, and then I die and I come back again. Uh, all the wonderful words that I've read all my life at, at each stage of my life. Uh, and it's a rather nice idea for, for uh, one man to be because in this, in this day and age, of, you know, we live in a Twitter world, a Twitter universe, and people have chosen to forget for some reason. The, the beauty and the extraordinary majesty of our language. And, here, here. Uh, We're kind of becoming a world of twits. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know who that refers to. <laughs> Is there a role that you have not played that you want to play? Oh, there are tons of them, Stu. Well, let's toss out a couple. All right. <laughs> what are you going to offer me, Ira? <laughs> I mean, how, there's, there's how about you, you put on some weight, you could be a TV weatherman. I, I can see it now. That could be false stop. Oh, that yeah. would be a great role. Except wearing all that padding. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
Christopher. Uh, it's okay, I've heard it before, Christopher. <laughs> we have a lady over here, I think. Yes. Or a mic? Or do you have a lot of yeah. We're going to ask you to all bring your own microphones in the future yes. when you come here to the playoffs. Have you ever played a president? Yes, I have, actually. I played Roosevelt in a television act. I can't remember the name of the television, but it was about Walter Winchell. And Stanley Tucci played Walter Winchell, and I played President Roosevelt. Uh, one, one, it's very easy to play Roosevelt. All you have to do is stick a cigarette holder in your mouth <laughs> and try to speak in that wonderful way he had. You know, and that's, that's it. That's it. How did you prepare for this film? You get the script and you go home. I didn't, I, I didn't hang around gay bars too long. <laughs> <laughs> it was all there on the script, Martin. It was all there in the script. I didn't have to do any research. I've known people like that, met them, I admired them, and I loved his humor. Uh, he had a lovely sort of quirky humor about himself. And it, it, was, it, it was a cinch. I didn't have to. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, how much time do you spend with the script, just uh, rehearsing a lot of uh, My, my, job, to talk my, to my job, uh, is you're supposed to be able to learn your lines in my profession. It's one of the, one of the things you have to do to, in order to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so it becomes second nature. And, and uh, the lines, if the script is good, it's a snap. I can remember them instantly, because you feel them instantly. Uh, if, they're, if it's a bad script, if you can take months trying to learn the funny thing. Well, it was an incredibly wonderful film, and uh, did you sit with Mike Miles and talk about his father? Did, no. did, did that occur? No. No, no. When, when I said at the beginning, You're right. I said, I'm terrified to play your own father. It's awfully personal, because you're going to look at me all the time, and I'm going to disappoint you. Yeah, he said, be yourself. Him. And that's not the case. He said, you must play it yourself at your most relaxed in this role. And uh, which was super of him to do. It was most generous. Well, now that's an interesting uh, question to me. Uh, are you relaxed or do you get nervous before the camera rolls or before the curtain goes up? Well, I, no, you don't get nervous. You get excited. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have too, too many nerves, I mean, you should give up the profession. I mean, I look forward to coming out, even though I, there's a moment where you think, oh, boy, and particularly in this one-man show that I've just done, which, which required an enormous amount of memory. I do Shakespeare, I do the Bible, I do Winnie the Pooh, I do a whole incredible melange of, of authors and poets, and you think, oh my God, am I going to remember it all? And then once you're out there, and the audience is there, you're fine. And if you get your first laugh, that's what I was, I was put something funny in the beginning, sort of like a dirty trick. Just, because if that works, then it gives you all the confidence you need for the rest of the evening. The audience may walk out, but you're happy. <laughs> that's what it's all about. Yes, I am. Do you, do you think you could have done this role if you had at age 50, 60, or, or was there, uh, did you need that uh, baggage of time and experience to help you play that particular no, I think I could have played it 20 years ago, but the man was in his 70s, so uh, I, I was, it was, he was closer to my age. Oh. But I could have played it because it was beautifully written. Mm -hmm. What's the quotation from Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> oh, I've, I've done lots of stuff from that. I'm halfway down, it's Christopher Robin. Christopher actually. Robin, yeah. Uh, one of them, halfway down the stairs, the stair where I sit. Uh, There's many of his death quite back here. <laughs> <laughs> Of what you said earlier that uh, acting your career and acting has been fun what a marvelous summation that is of any worthy pursuit but particularly that in the theater and in film well yeah um, i mean think how lucky we really are We're so, we are so spoiled in the concert world people have to pay for, for their own most of the time the soloists have to pay for their own hotel their own transportation we don't in our profession it's all paid for and we travel the world and we get paid for it. And then, first of all, that can, is luckier than ever. And on top of that, we meet people like you who enjoy coming to the theater and, and sharing an evening with you. There's nothing more satisfying. So I think it's a great blast 
And I think, I think we're all rather nice. There's some awful, stupid actors, of course. I'm not one of them. Now that you bring that up, are there actors you wouldn't work with? Or... Yeah, here we go. <laughs> and would you name them, please? Yeah. And give you their addresses. <laughs> No, no, it's a pretty terrific bunch, I think. And I think we're a brave, we're rather a brave lot. <laughs> we can make fools of ourselves and get away with it. <laughs> well, I think the affirmation of uh, how the audience feels about you occurred when you walked through the door over there, Christopher. We have one more question over here. Let me come to you with this microphone. I'd like to ask you about your experience of being in an audience. Are there whether it's the theater or whether it's movies, are there actors that you particularly enjoy seeing? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, there are three or four occasions in my life when I've sat in a theater and been so swept away by a performance that I could totally forgot I was actually in a theater. And that's what we all aim for, isn't it? That sort of wonderful kind of moment when you're taken out of the room and you don't know where you are and it doesn't matter. And one of those occasions was uh, uh, Robert Morse's extraordinary performance as Truman Capote, which uh, really was just one of the most magical performances. I know it's been done by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and I know that it's been done many other times, but his, his stage performance of that made me... I, I was up there on, on, on that stage with him. I wasn't in my seat at all. Things like that. Yeah, one, more. one more question. Mr. Plummer, um, I have a daughter who is a teenager and she is going to be pursuing acting. Um, she has a profession. Currently, her profession is babysitting, which is why she's not here tonight. But if you did have That's one... That's my second favorite. 